the former colonial powers that built their wealthy empire using what they looted around the globe. But now it seems that, very cunningly, they are changing colors. Yes, it seems that they are pretending to be more friendly because they are losing power and influence. And very ironically, they are now in desperate need of help from those they looted. But should a formerly colonized nation like India, which is working hard to rebuild and rise, allow itself to fall into anybody's trap? The meeting between Mori and Johnson has generated a lot of media attention and it is clear that post-Brexit, the United Kingdom's eyes are focused on India as it hopes to get a chunk from India's expected massive economic rise. But if the British want to work on their image in India, they could also use this opportunity to answer these five questions honestly. Question 1. United Kingdom, do you want to rob India of its best minds? When the British Prime Minister speaks about skilled workers from India plugging the labor shortage in the United Kingdom, many in his country blindly believe that they are doing India a favor by allowing more Indians to work in the UK, but the reality appears to be very shocking. It has been observed that the United Kingdom's low fertility rates or their baby shortage is linked to a shortage in the workforce which can negatively affect the United Kingdom's innovation and GDP. So, in other words, your nation hasn't given birth to enough babies. So now you want human beings from other nations to come, serve and protect you, right? Also, why don't you admit that to preserve the West's competitive edge in technology and innovation, you want to attract the best and the brightest minds from around the world? Mr. Johnson, I have in my possession the strategic report from your Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, which acts as your government advisory, and the report confirms this. But I want to ask you this. Why is it that you can't see or tolerate a non-Western country outperforming the West? Is it West's inherent right to preserve its competitive edge over others? And for that, it will even suck human talent out of other nations. How selfish and cunning does that sound? Instead of sucking their talent out of other countries, why don't you do more to provide skill training for your hundreds of thousands of homeless people, many of whom are jobless? Or why don't you focus on managing your own workforce better? How about improving the lives of those British women who, in the prime of their youth, are selling their dirty or unwashed underwear to men or are involved in sex work? Why not give those British citizens an alternative to serve British society? But we know that training your own population isn't that easy for you. For example, we know that it costs you a lot of money to train a doctor in the United Kingdom. And that is why we are not surprised by the fact that you save millions of pounds in training costs by importing thousands of doctors and nurses from poor and developing nations who your National Health Service desperately relies on. Yes, you save money on training costs by importing doctors and nurses from countries where the doctor population ratio is lower than yours and countries that have a severe shortage of healthcare workers. And when these foreign healthcare workers come to the United Kingdom, many of them face racism and institutionalized discrimination. UK, what do you have to say about that? And yes, don't forget that Indians employ you too. If there are more than 500 UK companies providing jobs in India, then there were more than 850 Indian companies operating in the UK, providing more than 100,000 jobs, according to this report published in 2021. Question 2. United Kingdom, how much do you earn through that terrible lifestyle that you offer? Your economy depends greatly on the foreign workforce for its own survival, but then why is it that these people of color are paying the ethnicity penalty in the UK through their insurance premiums? Why are they being charged more by the insurance companies even though they are living in a low crime area? In that case, when Indians come to your country to serve or save your economy, where should they seek accommodation if they don't want to pay the ethnicity penalty? in your neighborhoods where mostly white people reside, right? What would be your recommendation? UK, you enjoy a massive net economic benefit of £25.9 billion because of international students in just one single year. Yes, more than £25 billion, don't forget that. 
But when your universities are promoted in other countries, do they also inform the aspiring foreign students about the rampant sex crimes on your college campuses and elsewhere, your infamous sexist and misogynistic college drinking societies and the pornification of your leading universities? Do they also inform them about the terrible situation of alcohol intoxication and drug overdoses, about the epidemic of pedophilia in the British churches and British society, and about your very own British caste system that exploits immigrants who clean your toilets? Do they inform them about the discrimination that the children of migrants face, even if they are born in the UK as British citizens? And how about your pathetic public healthcare system, which has millions of patients on a waiting list for treatment, many of whom have been waiting for years despite suffering from pain and agony? Many in India are still blinded or mesmerized by the shiny image that you have successfully and cunningly projected for years and are not aware of the ugly reality that lies underneath. UK, why don't you tell your national broadcaster, the BBC, which has been described as your soft power asset, to spread the facts that I have highlighted in these episodes to ensure that they are in common knowledge in India? You do that properly for at least a decade and then see if the average Indian still has the same interest to work or study in the UK. But why would you do that? That move could be suicidal for the British economy and your soft power asset, BBC, may not like that. And just in case, if you want to brag about British aid again, that clever and deceitful trick may not work anymore, as I have already published an episode that exposes the ugly reality of your so-called British aid. Question 3. UK, are you fooling the world with your model of democracy, secularism and inclusivity? Yes, in your upper house of the parliament, 26 Church of England archbishops and bishops have an automatic right to sit and participate in your parliament proceedings. Yes, in your parliament, 26 seats are fixed for the Church of England bishops. Apart from you, the only country that does something similar is the Islamic Republic, Iran, and yet you have the audacity to preach about secularism and democracy to others. Now please pay attention. England and Wales, Muslim population 4.8%, Hindu population 1.5%. Despite this, you don't have national public holidays for the Hindu or Muslim festivals. Why only Christian festivals on this list? Do only Christians live in the UK? On the other hand, in India, Christmas is officially recognized as a government holiday even though Christians are only 2.3% of India's population. United Kingdom, you act as if you are the champion of secularism, but then why is it that sittings in your both houses of parliament begin with Christian prayers? Not only that, the official rules allow MPs who participate in these Christian prayers in the UK parliament to get the important advantage of securing their limited places to sit in parliament and the MPs who don't attend these Christian prayers often struggle to get a seat and are less likely to participate in the debate. Isn't this a living example of Christian supremacy, which is deeply ingrained in the very foundation and official proceedings of the UK Parliament? Question 4. UK, may I ask why the royal family is referred to as the racist family? Maybe you hoped that the facts would remain hidden forever, but people in the former British colonies are finally waking up. They are finally learning the truth about how the British treated them and how the British made a massive amount of dirty money exploiting and selling human beings. They are also learning that with a burning iron, enslaved Africans were marked upon their right breast with the letters DY, branding them as the property of the then Duke of York. United Kingdom, maybe you have kept your citizens in dark through your sanitized history, but you can't always hide the truth from everyone. Now consider this, India's current president, Sri Ram Nath Kovind, is the head of the state in India. Yes, a man from India's marginalized community holds the supreme position in the nation. The same community that many of you in the West refer to as the untouchables. On the other hand, your head of the nation is your queen. She is also the head of your armed forces. She is also the supreme governor of the Church of England. Yes, the same church that has the automatic right to appoint 26 bishops to the upper house of your parliament. United Kingdom, are you still living in medieval times? 
And by the way, may I ask what your queen thinks about the British Museum, whose trustees have been described as the world's largest receivers of stolen property? Question 5. UK, when will you properly learn how to treat Indians as equals? You have not properly asked for forgiveness for your colonial and other crimes, but many Indians still want to forgive you. But then, when your soft power asset, the BBC, broadcasts fake child slavery footage from India, it makes things complicated. When your senior journalist uses insulting words against India, it makes things complicated. And yes, when your media outlets run anti-India propaganda to stereotype Indian males as sexual predators, it does make things very complicated. Somehow, this attitude against India has been described as your cultural problem. United Kingdom, don't forget that today you seem almost desperate to have a trade deal with the rising economic power that is India. So at least now, for the sake of your own survival and for your greed-driven selfish goals, can you finally learn how to rid yourself of your superiority complex while engaging with India or Indians? See you again.